Hatred of ideas is something that is absolutely biblical. Revelation chapter 2, God in verses 1 through 7 was going to rebuke the Ephesians through the pen of John, but first he commended them for hating the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which he also hated. However, hatred of man is something that is condemned in Scripture. And right now, all around us, we see hatred. It's not something that is new. It's not something that has started recently. Racism has been a part of this country. It's been a part of, this, of the world uh, for much longer than any of us have been alive, for sure. And not just when it comes to black and white, but there are times I can remember growing up when it comes to even those from other countries, whether it be Asia, those who grew up uh, and lost loved ones in World War II, uh, who hated those in, in Asia, those who went through Korea. And while some may have grown an appreciation of love, others grew in hate, it would seem. But when it comes to what the Scriptures teach... Christ died for all, and that we are all from one blood. In that respect, regardless of our nationality, regardless of the color of our skin, regardless of our gender, we are all brothers and sisters in that respect. And unfortunately, many people don't see that. They don't want to see that. They want to put race over religion. They want, to put, uh, they want to put one thing over another. And, and we're left wondering, what is the answer? What do we do? How can we help the situation rather than hurt the situation without compromising our faith, without compromising the truth of God's will? I think in part the answer is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5. While the immediate context is how these brethren were going to give offerings to help uh, certain people who were brethren who were in need because of a famine that was taking place. There were those who were starving, those who were in great need for the necessities of this life, and they were wanting to help with that. Not only that, but help Paul and his journey along to deliver that aid as well. But they only had so much. They could only do so much. And then they went beyond. <clears throat> and you wonder, well, how, how was that possible? And verse 5 is the answer where it says that they gave themselves first to the Lord. And this is a statement that I think may, is, is one that we should be applying in a much greater context. A much greater effort in all that we do, as we will see in scriptures, to help the situation that we find ourselves in. To be bold and yet kind. To be gentle but uncompromising. This one thing would solve so much if everyone would apply it. Unfortunately, not everyone is going to apply it because there are those who will reject Christ. There are those who will reject God altogether. But in spite of that, we must not. Remember 2 Peter, rather 1 Peter, excuse me. 1 Peter chapter 3. There was a, a wife who was told to submit to her husband, to, to be gentle, to be soft-spoken, that maybe without a word, that through her chaste conduct, she might win her husband over to Christ. Here was a faithful woman who was a, doing her part to be as... as 
much of a faithful child of God as she possibly could be, with everything about her, was striving to put Christ first. But her husband wasn't. He wasn't listening to anything that she said. And, and Peter, in his instruction, says, without a word, but don't change your conduct if what you're doing is according to Christ, if what you're doing is according to God's will, don't stop that regardless of what He says, regardless of what He does, regardless of those around you. You have a responsibility to put Christ first, to give yourself first to the Lord. That's what the instruction was, even to that wife with an unbelieving husband. And so with that in mind, it seems to me that the best thing that we can do for anyone and everyone around us, regardless of where they may stand politically, regardless of where they may stand in the face of all of the, uh, the uh, protests and riots and, and everything else that is taking place, where we stand is with Christ. And that must never change. We are to live peaceably with all men with as much as within us is possible, Romans 12. We do our part. Is that going to change the world? Probably not. Is that going to change the mind of everyone that we come in contact with? No, it won't. Might it have an effect on someone? Absolutely. Absolutely. How we interact with others is vitally important moving forward. It, but it's always been that way. Regardless of our social class, regardless of our age, regardless of our race, regardless of our gender, we need to be aware of how we are interacting with those around us and to do so with love, with boldness, having given ourselves first to the Lord. Paul said it is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. Can we truly say that? If so, then how we treat others is going to be affected by that. It's going to be influenced by the very sacrifice that Christ made and who He made it for. When we do not give ourselves first to the Lord, I want you to think about what begins to take place. Think about the motivations of why we do certain things. Remember back in Malachi chapter 1, beginning there in verse 6, there were sacrifices that were being offered, but they were offering basically the leftovers. They were offering the lame and the sick. They were offering those things which, which God said, don't offer to me. In fact, he, Malachi goes on to rebuke them, saying, you wouldn't even offer these to your governors. The problem is they had not given themselves first to God. That, that, there's the beginning of it. Their heart wasn't right. And that mediocrity bred indifference. And they kept for themselves what they considered to be the best and beneficial for them. It was all about self-servitude, self-serving. Selfishness. Why would they give that to their governors to benefit themselves, to further along themselves in worldly relationships, in worldly status? When we're not giving ourselves first to the Lord, then, then what we do generally is affected by what we can get out of it. It's all about our own interest. You know, we cannot serve both God and man. And, and that's one thing that Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount. 
That you can't serve both God and man. You will hate one and despise the other. But something's got to give. Even when it comes to authority, Jesus begged the question, are these things from God or from man? There are two sources here. And which one are we going to give ourselves to? Now, the problem that many look at is, but if everyone doesn't do it, then it doesn't work. And that's where you're wrong. Because you jumped ahead to a conclusion that is out of, your contr- out of your control. Let's back up to what you can control. And that's yourself. This is your responsibility. You can't force anyone, make anyone to give themselves first to the Lord. They may not do it. This is up to you for yourself. To give yourself first to the Lord in all that you do. Regardless of how others may treat you, regardless of accusations that they may make against you, they did it to Christ, they will do it to us. We we need to come to grips with that, but we need to know moving forward that our hope eternally in the glories of heaven is dependent upon this thing. No longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. God or this world? What do we love? What do we desire? What do we want? Think about that. Are we showing a partiality in preaching and teaching the gospel that we should not be showing? The world is setting standards that God has not set, that we must not abide by. We must stick with the truth that lives and abides forever. The world is involved in retaliation. The crazy thing about it is the retaliation against things that didn't even happen to themselves. But nevertheless, they are involved in retaliation. And sometimes we're caught in the middle. But ultimately, it comes down to nothing more than self-serving for themselves. We must first give ourselves to the Lord. And when we do, what happens when we don't is it, it, it becomes about us. But when we do give ourselves first to the Lord, look at Colossians chapter 3, verses 22 and 23. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 22 and 23, He's going to make a point. Regardless of the situation, regardless of the circumstance, because in various situations and circumstances, this point is made. It happens to be talking about slaves and masters. But he says, work heartily as to the Lord. Think about that. Work heartily as to the Lord. As to the Lord. Literally, from the soul. Work from the soul as though you were doing it for the Lord. When you interact with anyone and everyone, do it as though you are speaking directly for the Lord to them. The NRSV translation says to put yourself into it. Put yourself into it in that particular verse. Philip's translation says to put your whole heart and soul into it. Is that what we're doing And when we live our lives? When we go about everything that we do, whether it's at work, in interactions with neighbors, with friends, with, with strangers... 
Have we given ourselves first to the Lord so that from our soul we do it diligently? We speak the truth diligently. We show kindness and love diligently. That we give it all we've got to show them the love of God and the hope of eternal life that is offered to everyone. Even if those around us do not give themselves, even if they, in, 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 of course, again, by worldly standards, don't deserve it. Listen, we don't deserve what God did for us, do we? Of course not. We don't deserve it. But we keep Christ and the church and that relationship in mind in everything we do. And we understand that He is the head of the church. He is the head of the body. He is the King of the kingdom. He is the foundation of the building. He is the shepherd of the fold. He is the husband of the bride. Christ is everything to us. And I think Paul showed us exactly what it means in our treatment towards those around us. Even when they're filled with hate, even when they're filled with confusion, when they're filled with error. Go to Romans chapter 1. And look at verse 14. In the book of Romans chapter 1, we're going to begin in here in verse 14. I want you to notice what Paul says. Paul says, I am under obligation. Now, some translations read this a little different. I am a debtor, they will say. I am a debtor or I am under obligation to both. Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and the foolish. So I am eager to preach to you who are in Rome also. And he goes on in verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for, to all or everyone who believes. I want you to go back to verse 14 and look at that. I am under obligation or I am indebted to. You ever think about that particular statement? It's something we've gone over but it's been a few years, probably four or five years ago since we've looked at this or talked about it that I can remember. But if you keep, keep your marker there and go to 1 John chapter 4, verse 11. 1 John chapter 4, verse 11. Just to get a little bit more perspective on what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 1, verse 14. When he says, I am indebted or I uh, am under obligation. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 11... John says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. You see that word ought? We ought to love one another. You know what's the same word that Paul is using in Romans chapter 1 when he says, I am under obligation or I am indebted to so in, in 1 John 4, what he's saying there is, you know, because God has loved us, we are under obligation or we are indebted to love one another. Now there's one of those one another statements, talking about brethren, beloved, our brothers and sisters in Christ by all means. But Paul takes it even a step further in Romans chapter 1, verse 14. He says, I am under obligation. I am indebted to the Greeks and the barbarians 
Now think about this. What he is saying is to those who, who are known for mistreating others, those who are known for their hatred for others, those who are known for uh, their disdain for fellow man in many ways, for going in and, and wiping out tribes and peoples, for abusing and mistreating their fellow man and haven't treated Paul any different, certainly no better. And here is Paul saying, I am under obligation to them. I am indebted to them. Why would he say that? How could he say that? Because he gave himself first to the Lord, because it's no longer him who lives, but Christ who lives in him. It is because of what God has done for him. Because, notice again back in 1 John 4, verse 11, because God loved us, we ought to love one another. It didn't say because of how one another is treating us, because how our brethren talks to us, because of, of what they are doing or not doing to us, that has nothing to do with it. Think about that. How they treat us is not in the equation. It's how we treat them because of how God has treated us. That's what it's about. Because of God's love for us. Because of God's blessings towards us. Because of what He has done. Because of what He has promised to us. That's why Paul said he was under obligation, indebted to those around him, to his fellow man, regardless of how certain worldly standards may say they are terrible people or not. Regardless of their treatment or mistreatment towards him, he has a responsibility. We have a responsibility. To share God's love with them. They may reject it. They may hate us even more for it. But we are obligated. We are indebted to them. And I, I tell you, that sometimes is a hard concept to wrap our heads around. When we think about retaliating. When we think about being snarky and talking back and, and, and you know, they want to talk to us that way, I'm not, I'm not going to stand for that. I'm going to talk right back that way. Stop. Give ourselves first to the Lord. Listen, Christ didn't back down. Christ pointed out what needed to be pointed out. But it wasn't to win an argument. It wasn't to make a point, And it wasn't to feel better about himself. It was to benefit their soul. That's why he did it. And when we talk and when we act, that's what must be at the heart of what we are doing as well to benefit the souls around us, regardless of what they may believe, what they, the reason they may think we're doing it. As much as with, within your power, live peaceably with all men. Do what you can to show Christ in your life and how He can benefit the lives of others. That's what we need to be doing to anyone and everyone. Whether they want it or not, regardless of how they treat us, we stand firm. Gentleness, kindness, love, uncompromising, and boldly proclaiming the truth. They hated Christ for it, and they'll probably hate us for it as well. But we do it anyway.
because we owe it to them. Not because of what they have done for us, but because of what God has done for us. And what God did for us, most importantly, is He gave His Son on that cross to die, to shed His blood. He was buried, but He overcame death and rose from the dead. And now He calls all of us who would believe to confess our faith, to repent of our sins, and to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of our sins. The blood of Christ will wash them away. And we'll rise to walk in newness of life. But how do you think saying that attracts those around us if we're not living a life that shows what it truly means to have Christ in us and to be a part of that family of God? Think about that as we go forward throughout this week. But if you know and you desire that hope, you desire that fellowship and that relationship with God, you can make your life right today before it's everlasting too late. And if we can help you, we'll be happy to do so by letting you come to the front as together we stand and sing the song of encouragement.